Who else? <laughs> Going to be some changes at the White House. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to share with you this morning some of the more significant results of this trip and to take a few of your questions before we leave for home. The journey to Europe has involved many highs and, yes, some anguishing moments. It took us to one of Europe's youngest capitals and two of its oldest, and to a city which symbolizes the continuing quest for European unity. And at every stop, I emphasize that our European friends can count on the United States to be their partner, to help them grow, to support their democratic aspirations, and to stand with them to protect the peace. We are leaving today with our Atlantic ties strengthened, and we're returning home, mission accomplished. Let me summarize what I believe to be our lasting achievements. First, our visit to the Federal Republic has strengthened U.S.-German relations and the prospects for continuing peace in Europe. The German leadership characterized our visit as opening a new page in German history. I believe that our partnership and friendship have never been greater or stronger. At the Bonn Economic Summit, we agreed to a common strategy to ensure continued economic prosperity and job creation. We also moved closer to our goal of launching a new multilateral trade round to eliminate barriers to free trade. All the summit countries have agreed to the need for a new round. All but one agreed that it should begin early next year. We were pleased that our partners endorsed U.S. efforts in Geneva to achieve significant reductions in nuclear arms. We also reached agreement for intensified cooperation against international drug trafficking. Next, at the European Parliament in Strasbourg, we set forth a sensible framework for improved U.S.-Soviet relations based on strength, realism, peaceful competition, and negotiations. I conveyed to the Soviet Union once again America's heartfelt desire for peace. The constructive, common-sense initiatives we propose to reduce tensions between us deserve a serious Soviet response. In Spain and Portugal, we further enhanced our ties with two close friends and valued partners. It was heartening to see firsthand the strides these two courageous democracies have made, both politically and economically. It's been a long, historic, and thoroughly worthwhile trip. Issues of major significance were dealt with openly, vigorously, and in depth. And from our meetings came a strongly shared commitment to freedom, democracy, growth, and European unity. And now, I don't think I've left anything unanswered, but you probably want to ask some questions anyway. All right, Andrea. Mr. President, a week ago you said it would be an irresponsible act if anyone agreed to zero growth on defense. Yes. Now you've accepted that, and you've also accepted no increase, a freeze on all codes, including Social Security. Can you explain about your ca campaign promise and why you've changed your mind? Well, let's take the defense matter first. The zero growth is for one year, the first year, and then the growth rate that we'd asked for for the next two years is included in this. But at the same time, and uh, just a little while ago, and it, somewhere around 4 o'clock in the morning in Washington, uh, I had the assurance of the senators that this is done with the proviso that if at any time it, the zero growth uh, reveals in the coming year that it is going to in any way uh, reduce our national security or harm it in any way, I will be back asking for a supplemental to overcome that. Now, the second thing you asked about was uh, Social Security. Well, first of all, I never, I never felt during the, when I was answering the accusations that were made in a somewhat demagogic way in the campaign that I was going to cut the, de the benefits, reduce them for the recipients, and I was denying that I had any such idea or would ever have any such idea. I didn't have in my mind that we were talking about any potential or possible increases. But it was taken that way, interpreted that way, so okay, I live with that. The thing that has been agreed to actually will amount to about the same uh, benefits as the two, two, and two, uh, which I proposed. 
Now, we have found that the 2-2-2 two, two, two that I had proposed, that most people aren't aware of all of the terms of that. Uh, and this is particularly true of the Social Security recipients. Most of them were not aware or did not recall that if inflation drops below 3 percent, there is no COLA. And most of them were not aware that R2, 2, and 2 was 2 plus any percentage of increase in, in inflation above 4 percent. And when this was pointed out to them in surveys, roughly around 70 percent of the people preferred that and said that they would, uh, they would take that. Now, as I say, we have, uh, all right, so we have held for one year a freeze in this and then return to the normal COLA process. So, um, and as I say, for three years, that comes out about even to the 222. So the other thing that I did say was that unless I was faced with a mandate, and I would suggest that I was say, faced with a mandate when 79% of the senators, which means pretty much half and half Democrat and Republican, uh, demanded that we have some uh, some curbing of the colas. Helen? Uh, do you plan to go to the UN uh, in the fall with possibility of meeting Gorbachev? And why is it that you can preach reconciliation to the Germans who, who committed so many horrors and not say the same thing to the Soviet Union on this trip? Well, I thought that I had said some things. I told about the changes that we felt in this unifying of Europe should take place, but I also emphasized that it must take place peacefully that I was not suggesting any, any hostile action. The, with regard to going to the UN, no, we have no confirmation yet that Mr. Gorbachev is coming. Uh, the word probable was, uh, is about the best way to describe it, but it did not, that statement did not come from him. I then extended an invitation that if he was going to be here, the door was open uh, for a meeting between us. And that still goes, so the, the ball is in his court, first to decide whether he's coming here, and then second, uh, as to time and place for such a meeting, if he is willing. Yeah. Yeah. President, in the past you've drawn a distinction between uh, dictatorships on the right and Marxist dictatorships, saying those on the right can evolve into democracies, but communist dictatorships never do. Yet here in Europe uh, you have talked about the changes you want to see in Eastern Europe, where communist dictatorships are most deeply entrenched. How do you see those changes taking place, and what is your role in those changes? Well, we've said that we would be most helpful to anyone who wants to make this modification. We have seen enough examples uh, in the Americas alone of uh, military dictatorships or just outright dictatorships and pressure from the people in the democratic process changing those to the point that today, south of our border, Roughly 90% of the people in what we call Latin America are now living in democracies or in countries that are moving toward democracy. And the only two totalitarian powers in our uh, hemisphere are Nicaragua and Cuba. The, so it is true that there is evidence that uh, right-wing governments or dictatorships, well, we're standing in one that has gone from dictatorship to, uh, to democracy. The same was true in, uh, in Spain when we were there. But it is true that the, what has been called the Brezhnev Doctrine has uh, been predominant that once they get their grip in a country, it doesn't change. There are evidences that that isn't true. Well, as a matter of fact, that too happened here because in addition to dictatorial tradition, uh, there was a time when uh, communism seemed to be uh, moving in here, and again, the people of Portugal uh, made that change. Bill, and then I'll take you. Mr. President, a few days ago, an official of your government, Richard Pearl in the Defense Department, said that it was his opinion that it was time for the United States to start violating or stop observing the SALT agreements. First of all, sir, what do you think of him offering that opinion? And second, what do you think about it? Is it time to stop observing the SALT agreement? Well, first of all, you know, in that country of ours, everyone's got a right to express their opinion. And uh, he was doing no more than that. Uh, 
something that I know is very precious to all of you. Uh, but um, I would. Uh, I'm trying to think of how I how I want to answer this uh, this question. Maybe you better reframe that last part again, so I can get my mind switched well, from I, whether he had a right. Let to me it put it this way, sir. What do you think? Is it time for the United States to stop uh, observing the uh, SALT Treaty, which, of right. course, we've never yeah. uh, ratified? Uh, we have tried, on what seemed to be a verbal agreement between ourselves and the Soviet Union for some time, that even though we had not ratified that treaty, it had been signed by the negotiators, that we, uh, that we would both seek to abide by the, the terms. There's considerable evidence now that um, uh, that has been rather one-sided. And uh, if it has been, then there's no need for us to, us to continue. But whether we do or not, that's a decision to be made down the road. Actually, we have not come to a point in which we in any way, in our own buildup, are um, uh, violating or going beyond the terms of that treaty. It is possible, with regard to one system of weapons, that we might come to such a point. And we'll make that decision then, and if we do, we'll do it openly, and we will do it with full uh, knowledge of the Soviet Union. Yes, sir. Almost everywhere that you went in Europe, the foreign leaders opposed the Nicaraguan trade embargo, and we now hear that Costa Rica has opposed it. Why is it, sir, that some of your closest allies don't back you on this and don't seem to feel that Ortega and the Sandinistas are the threat that you think he is? I don't think there's any question, Chris, that they don't agree with us about the threat. They do. They know what Nicaragua is. On the other hand, we're running into a kind of a philosophical difference here, I think, with regard to sanctions. We did a lot of soul searching about it ourselves. Uh, there are a number of people, and certainly a number of governments, who just don't believe in that as a, a legitimate weapon. On the other hand, when we were trying to get aid for the people of Nicaragua in their struggle for democracy and against totalitarianism. Uh, many of our own people in the Congress brought up the fact of how could we be doing this at the same time that we continued to maintain relations. Well, we had continued to maintain relations and even including trade relations with them as a refutation of their charge that we were seeking their overthrow. All we have ever sought is that they, as one faction, when I say they, I mean the Sandinista government, that Sandinista government has never been legitimized by the people. It is one faction of a revolution that overthrew an, a dictator. And they stole that revolution away from the other factions, which we now call the Contras. And the leaders of the Contras were leaders in that revolution also. And in doing that, we have felt that what we, what we are seeking and have been trying to pressure them to do is to come together again in discussion and negotiations to restore the promises they themselves had made as to what the goals of the revolution were. And in doing that, and as I say, to refute their charges that we were somehow threatening them with aggression. And if you will remember, there was a time when Mr. Ortega had us every other week uh, landing the Marines in Nicaragua. And uh, we never had any intention of doing such a thing. So we maintained our embassy there. We continued our trade to show that uh, uh, what we really wanted to do. And uh, then uh, in this recent uh, vote in the Congress, we found many congressmen justifying their position on the grounds that how could we still be uh, doing business and, and uh, yet wanting to, to aid these this other factions of the revolution. And we have decided that uh, pressure is needed to bring them to the realization that they should restore the original goals of, of their revolution. Uh, all right. Mr. President, uh, in recent days, uh, uh, Mr. Gorbachev has had some rather harsh things to say about uh, the United States and about, and about you. If there is a summit meeting, what would you have to uh, talk about and what do you think that such a meeting could uh, reasonably produce uh, in the current climate? Well, I think there'd be a lot to talk about. And I just happen to believe that it's time we started talking to each other instead of about each other. And um, 
with regard to the harsh things that he's had to say about me, what's new about that? Uh, that, that I think has been consistent not only with me, but with every other American president. Uh, it's just their way of doing things. President, a few days ago, I'd like to go back to the defense budget. A few days ago, you told us it would be an irresponsible act to freeze it. This morning, you seem to say it's okay to freeze it, but if you discover in the future that it is irresponsible, you'll go back to Congress. Doesn't that suggest, sir, that you don't really have a firm view of what figure is needed? And doesn't it open you up in the House of Representatives to the House taking more out of the defense budget? Not one penny more should be taken out of that budget that has been given now. And as I've said, we're talking about the year of 1986, and I have the agreement of the Senate that if this represents, and I, in my own mind, feel that it does represent a cut in spending beyond which we should go, that um, uh, they recognize that I will be returning for a, a supplemental uh, appropriation. On the other hand, I have to point out to you that in this, um, we have gotten more than 90% of what we have asked for in the budget. It will amount to some $56 billion this year, almost $300 billion, which was our goal over the uh, first three years. And there's no questioning the importance of sending a signal to not only the world, but to our own business and financial communities that we are determined to deal with a deficit problem that has been a democratic heritage for the last 50 years of deficit spending, continued deficit spending. And once and for all, we're going to try to get hold of it. Yes, Leslie? Yeah. Mr. President, as you probably well know, you've been called the Teflon president now for almost five years. Uh, you, in this uh, Senate vote on the budget, uh, asked for a 6% increase in defense and no cuts in Social Security. Why shouldn't this be interpreted as a cave-in on your part? And do you think that the Teflon has begun to peel? No. I have always believed from all my past experience as a negotiator that um, you recognize that the other fellow is uh, probably going to um, offer less than whatever you ask. And uh, I've always uh, kind of believed in leaving a cushion there uh, for dealing. But um, this time, uh, things have changed. This was a deal, the, uh, I don't like the word deal, this was the working out. Uh, of a budget that was acceptable to the, to the Senate as well as to ourselves. And I think that the first one we presented was a very sound budget. But I recognize that in the give and take uh, that must take place in a system such as ours uh, to attain more than 90% of what we asked for uh, means that, all right, we can we can do some giving uh, along the line also. Mr. President, uh, Mr. President Mike Deaver says the uh, Portuguese president is waiting. Oh, I have a president waiting for me here. Can I take one more? Uh, I did. All right, one more, and then I'm sorry. Mr. President, since you've shown a, a willingness to compromise on the budget on defense and some of the spending programs, would you also be willing to compromise on your tax reform program as a price of getting that, or 90% of it, to accept perhaps a temporary tax increase or a surcharge? No, you've now come down to what was part of uh, our success in getting what we have. They all know that I absolutely will not accept a proposal for a tax increase. I think it is the worst kind of economic practice to do that. I think it would endanger our recovery. And they know that I will veto any proposal that comes to me for a tax increase. They also know that I have a signed letter signed by 146 representatives, which is enough to sustain a veto, that uh, I have that in my pocket also. Uh, so. They tell me I have to go that your president is waiting. Right? Yeah. You want this to is, uh, mention something about Yes, mine. I'm going to. Yeah. What, what you... Stefan Kamenev, Portuguese television. Yes. Uh, one question, Mr. President. 
would you compare the reception you have here in Portugal uh, with those in other countries in Europe? Would you compare your reception here in Portugal? Well, may I say to you that every place I've been in Europe, I have been impressed by the warmth of the people, uh, by their uh, open hospitality and, and welcome to me. And uh, that has held true here as uh, much as in any other country. And I have been greatly heartened uh, by the reception of the people. Now, if in your mind you are thinking in terms of certain demonstrations, well, uh, I'd have that in my own country. There is a faction wherever you go uh, that's on the other side. And uh, it happens to be a faction that kind of goes out of its way to be rude and nasty in uh, expressing its opinion. But uh, I've just come to accept that as part of the way of life. And as Harry Truman said, if you can't stand the heat, uh, stay out of the kitchen. So. Uh, I just have to tell you, I'm most gratified. I think I leave with uh, sound friendships with the people of your government, personal friendships, as well as an alliances between us or agreements between us. And I'm very pleased. Let me just say one thing, and then I have to, have to go back here. Since there has been a lot of discussion about uh, some members of my administration, and one in particular, and this being Mike Deaver's last day, I just want to say to you, that I consider Mike's leaving in the nature of an amputation. And it is me that is suffering the amputation. He has been with us a number of years. I have never found fault with anything that he's doing, with his loyalty, with his friendship, and with the common sense that he has always used. And that extends to the arrangements for this trip and the part that he has played in the arranging of the trip, and while it was very difficult, uh, I know that most of you were totally exhausted. Uh, some of us uh, managed to survive a little better. Uh, if so, it's because we had Mike working in our behalf, uh, particularly, and uh, he's going to be greatly missed. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Al, about when are you going to send the tax bill up? No more.